So uh, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago for Palm Sunday, I uh, encouraged you guys on how we allow our expectations to define our revelation of Jesus. And it should be the other way around. It should be our revelation should define our expectations. And I want to continue with that this morning just real briefly uh, to kind of warm you up for Tanya. Uh, and I want to talk about Ruth. And those of you that have been here that have heard me minister, and I don't know why, but Ruth has really become one of my favorite um, uh, chapters, books, stories to minister on. And uh, many of you know that I love the names of Jesus and a revelation of Jesus. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But it's one of the best uh, I think one of the most, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's just one of the sweetest stories of a Redeemer kinsman, a type and shadow of who Jesus is to us in the church today. And today I want to actually talk about Naomi. And I want to talk about how, again, how expectations, typically we allow expectations or circumstances to define our revelation of the Lord instead of allowing our revelation and knowledge and knowing of God to define our expectations. So we're going to pick it up in uh, chapter 1, verse 19, but let me kind of tell you where we're at in the story. Uh, so Naomi is married to Eli Melech. They have two sons, and there's a famine in the land. And they leave, the fam they leave Israel, they leave their home in Bethlehem, and they go to Moab. And the two sons marry in Moab, and they marry two wives, one's named Orpah and one's named Ruth. And tragedy befalls their family, and not just one, not just two, but three of all three of the men die. Now, thank God for, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, us evolving as a society, us, us growing as a society that women are not as dependent on men as they used to be when it comes to, uh, you know, society and how uh, they, can, they can become equal income earners and uh, they can become, you know, anything they really want to become. They, you know, it really gives women have the opportunity to advance to whatever skill set and intelligence level that they choose to be. And from an income perspective, they can also uh, be independent as well. That was not the case in this season. Uh, if you did not have a husband, you were pretty much out of luck. Uh, you were pretty much going to be despondent. You were pretty much probably going to be a widow. You were pretty much going to have to be taken care of if you would buy the state. And so this puts Naomi in a very difficult situation. Uh, now, Naomi left because there was a famine in the land, and she, the word came back to her that, you know, the harvest is now come and the famine's over. So she decides to go back to Bethlehem. So she has two daughter-in-laws and she goes and basically says, I've got nothing to offer you. Now, what is she really saying? There's two things, as I mentioned earlier. <sighs> Number one, they were Moabites. I don't want to go into all the history of that right now because of, I want to make sure that Tanya has plenty of time, but that was not a good thing. That was, uh, I, there's really, we're, we're pretty good in our society now about not holding people's heritages against them, but that was not a good thing. They were actually in Israel uh, God had instructed them, don't intermarry with people in other tribes. That was a no-no. So to be a foreigner in the land was bad enough. You were pretty much going to probably end up being a prostitute. You were probably end up just open to being raped and abused. And you did, had no rights. You had no rights uh, in Israel. You had no rights under the law. So that was not a good thing. But to be married and now widowed and going home, that was even worse. Because, I mean, that was like having a... Uh, was the scarlet letter. I mean, you were pretty much, uh, your, your status within this uh, society was going to be tremendously diminished. So Naomi has nothing to offer these two women. And she's trying to uh, implore them to stay where they're at because you're better off staying here and in your land and, you know, finding potentially another husband, you know, to your own customs and then, you know, to your own ways of life. And so Orpah agrees and stays. But Ruth says, and it's the very famous line, wherever you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. And so they come back into the land. And I want to pick it up here. And, they, and Ruth uh, and Naomi return to Bethlehem. Verse 19. So now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them, and all the women said, Is this Naomi? So she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. 
I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has tested against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned and Ruth and the Moabites, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So I want to point out the name. The name Naomi means pleasant. The name Mara means bitter. And I want to look at the expectations we're talking about our expectation defining our revelation or our revelation defining our expectations. So what is Naomi's expectation here? Now, it's great for preachers to get up in the pulpit and tell you when you go through hard times, you just got to believe, folks. You just got to have faith. When all you can do, you just got to stand. You know, you just got to read the word more. You just got to, you just got to be encouraged and you got to listen to more worship music and you just have to, you know, keep yourself up, have a positive mentality, right? I mean, that's, it's great when preachers get up and say that, but you know, when you get, when life deals you some pretty tough challenges, that's, that's hard, isn't it? You know, when you lose your job, you got medical conditions, you got a wife, you got to figure out how you're going to take care of. Come on. I mean, what, you know, I, I, you guys knew our situation last year. I, I got laid off. Tanya was going through a tragic dif- uh, a medical situation. Uh, you know, I, I, we've got folks in the family that have gone through crazy lawsuits and things like that from family members that have forced them out of their place of business. When you're growing up, they don't give you a rule book for these things. They don't say, hey, guess what? Be prepared for some of the circumstances and challenges that life throws at you, right? And sometimes preachers, I feel a little bit disingenuous because they get up and just say, you just got to have faith, brother. You just got to pray your way through it. You got to encourage your way through it. Sometimes it's just bitter, isn't it? Sometimes life is just bitter. Sometimes there's nothing there that says God is with me. It's like all of a sudden the favor of the Lord has left me. All of a sudden the goodness of God is no longer there. It doesn't matter how much I pray. It doesn't matter how much I give. It doesn't matter how much I rebuke. It doesn't matter how much I deliver. My circumstances don't change. I, you may not have been there, but I've been there. Anybody else been there? Sometimes it's okay. It's okay to say, you know what? Bitterness of life has wore me down. But I do, want to, I do want to say, it does matter where you go. It does matter where you return to. In those times in our lives, we can return to things that gives us temporary escapes. Maybe I find it in alcohol. Maybe I find it in some other pleasurable thing. Maybe I find it in entertainment. Maybe I find it in work. I don't know. We retreat to something in those times. And I think it's important to remember that in those times, yes, life's hard. It's bitter. It's challenging. Sometimes it's like the, you know, the night just doesn't give way to the dawn, does it? It's like it just won't end. But it is important where you return to. It is important to where you retreat to. Even if you're coming into the place where there is a covenant between God and man and the presence of the Lord is there, and I don't feel like that the presence of the Lord is there, it matters where you retreat to. And it matters. But what I want to point out here more than anything is that what is Naomi's expectation? Her expectation for her life. Her circumstances has defined her revelation. Her circumstances actually has defined her expectation. Right? She's thinking, I just need to figure out a way to survive. I would bet you, I don't even know how much she's worried about Ruth, because for her own part, she's probably thinking, I don't know how we're going to make ends meet. I don't know how we're going to eat. I think there was provisions under the laws for widows, but I don't know exactly how that would be applied. You know, I don't have that sort of deep knowledge. But I think it's safe to say, it's not a stretch to say, she was in survival mode. Would we all agree with that? She's in survival mode. Her circumstances have defined her expectation, not her revelation defining her expectation. So what happens here is in chapter 2 is that Naomi gets up and says, I'm going to glean. I'm going to go out and see if I can figure out if I can get us something to eat. Now, you all know a little bit. I'm not going to go into the history, but what would happen was in the harvest time, as they would bring harvest, they would leave, if you will, uh, crumbs for the rich man table on the fringes. And so the poor could come and take and glean what was left on the fringes, and they could eat. Usually, history says, they were typically trying to get a meal a day. 
If they could get two meals a day, that would be great. Or maybe a meal for their family a day. But that's typically when you see they talk about gleaning, when they're going through and harvesting back in the agricultural days, they would leave just a little bit on the fringes for those to come and glean. So she says, I'm going to go figure out if I can find some place to glean. So Naomi says, go. So there's many, many fields she can go to. Remember, Ruth has no clue about this culture. She has no clue about Naomi's family. There's not like a family tree sitting up there with where their you know, addresses are and said, well, I can figure out where I want to go to figure out who would be favorable to me. No. She goes and gleans and begins to glean in a field that just so happens to be a relative of Naomi. Isn't it interesting? Again, where you put your effort in, where you glean matters. Because what she found is that Boaz came along, who was a very wealthy uh, man. He was a relative of Naomi, and he noticed her. Now, there's, you can debate on why he noticed her. Well, he was attracted to her. He was this. Probably because she was foreign. She was new. She was different. It's like, I don't notice her. There were other women out there gleaning on the field. And so he noticed her, and he asked his foreman, and the foreman says, this is Naomi's daughter-in-law. So from there... Boaz begins to extend kindness. He says, you stay here, you glean in my field, I'm going to protect you. And he honored her because of the relationships he, she had with Naomi. And he honored Naomi because of the covenant relationship between God and man, which was the law. So not only did he say, we want you to protect her, but when it came to eat, he told her, we want you to come and eat at our table. And then he said, I don't want you to just come eat at our table, I'm going to bless you exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think because it says she had so much to eat she put back some for Naomi then she went to glean that afternoon what did he do he said I want you to leave a little extra for her he told his workers don't tell her but I want you to leave a little extra for her and I forget what it was but she ends up going home with what's called an ephah so remember they're usually going home with a meal or two maybe I can feed my family for dinner and breakfast she goes home with like a week's worth of meals Think about that. To me, that shows the heart of the Father. That shows the heart of the Redeemer that says, even though you don't think you deserve it, even though you don't know I'm working on your behalf, I'm working on your behalf. See, you don't know that I'm leaving a little extra on the field. You, th you think that's something that maybe is coming your way, but I'm doing that out of the kindness and generosity of my heart. Keep in mind, Ruth has no rights. She is considered basically below the below. I'm trying to think of very kind ways to say it. She is not considered anyone here that would be of value to the people of Jerusalem, to the people of Israel, much less to Boaz, who is a wealthy man and could have any woman that he wants. Keep that in mind. He is a wealthy man that can have any woman that he wants. So she brings home an ephath, and this gets Naomi's attention. So real quickly, chapter 2, 17 So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Then she took it and went into the city to her mother-in-law. And her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, so she brought it out and gave to her what she had and kept back after she had been satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? And blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man that, that the name that I worked for today was Boaz. Then Naomi said to the daughter-in-law, Blessed be he, the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. Why is that important? The living and the dead. Because the law said that those that were living should take care of the widows. So she immediately recognizes that this relative has honored Ruth because of her relationship with uh, Eli. So what he's, she's saying here is that Boaz is honoring the law. He's honoring the covenant between God and man and has showed her favor because of the relationship between God and man and the covenant of God and man. The man is a relative of ours, one of our near kinsmen. The Ruth of the Moabite has said, He also said to me, You shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with young women and that the people do not meet you in any other field. She said she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and wheat harvest and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. I want you to notice the difference in the expectation now between Naomi and Ruth 
when there is a revelation of their Redeemer. All of a sudden, they're not so worried about where, how men are going to meet. All of a sudden, they're not so worried about who's going to protect them. All of a sudden, this stress and anxiety and challenge, where does all that come from? It comes out of a revelation of their Redeemer. It did not come to Ruth. Ruth has no clue, folks. She has no idea what Redeemer kinsman means in the Old Covenant. Nothing. She has nothing. She has no idea. So a point I want to make here is that a lot of times we pick on the Baptist or we pick on the evangelical or we pick on, hey, we're going to get out early. We'll beat the Baptist to lunch, you know. But you can't have knowledge. Excuse me, I'm saying that wrong. You cannot have a knowing of God until you have a knowledge of God. I cannot ask Tanya out for dinner if I never meet her. If I have no concept that she's alive... Therefore, I can never fall in love with her. If I never fall in love with her, I can never have intimacy with her. So my point being simply here, it matters. It matters that you have knowledge of the word. It matters that you have knowledge of the covenant relationship with God. It matters if that is the season that you're in. That When Nick, you say this revelation of Jesus and this intimacy with Jesus and having this relationship with Jesus doesn't connect with me. I don't really get it. it you know what? Sometimes it starts with knowing the Word. We serve the living Word, which is the Word that was there before creation began, but we also consume the living word which is given us in the word. And the reason I think that's important is because Naomi's knowledge of the covenant relationship is going to help her position Ruth for a great blessing. If you as a parent, as a grandparent, do not have knowledge of what is available to you and your family in the covenant, how are you going to position your family for all that God has for you? You say, well, I don't have the relationship you do, and I, I don't prophesy like Tanya does, and I don't pray for healing like, uh, you know, Pastor Rich does, or, you know, I don't have the wisdom that Mike does. Listen, if you don't have the Word, how are you going to position your family for all that God has for them to do and be? And I would encourage you, and I'm not going to stay here, I would encourage you as parents, one of the things that we do is we want to protect our children from all the things that the world has uh, to offer, if you will. All the challenges and difficulties. One of the things that Tanya and I did is we said, and Hope can attest to this, you can't know God through my relationship. You can't, and my, I would say it this way, you can't have a, relation, a revelation of Jesus through the eyes of your grandfather or your grandmothers or your parents. You have to know God for yourself. But I think one thing Tanya and I did a pretty good job of is we positioned our children in a way that they could receive blessings, encouragement, knowledge, understanding of who God is. There is a point here where we're going to read it. In fact, I'll just highlight it in chapter 3 because I'm running out of time. I'm going too long. Tanya said I, that's why she made me go first. She knew I'd go long and she wouldn't have to go as long. That in the very next chapter 3, she goes to uh, Ruth, or Naomi says... Uh, this is the situation going on. It's the end of the barley harvest. And she basically encourages Ruth and instructs Ruth how to go and approach Boaz. There's a technical way to do that in the Old Covenant. And so what's interesting is that Ruth basically says, whatever you tell me to do, I will do. I want to encourage your parents and your grandparents. You may have done everything right as a parent. You may have raised your children under the knowledge and admonition of the Lord. You may have trained your child in the knowledge and admonition of the Lord. And they can still choose to do the wrong things. Okay? Sometimes what we do is we try to, out of fear, protect our children from all of these things. We want them to know through our own experiences, our own wounds, our own difficulties, why you don't want to make these decisions in life because look at what it did to me and I've done these things so that you don't have to do these things. It's important to remember that Ruth was willing. Ruth was willing to say, I will walk this out. Ruth was willing to say, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. As a parent, I cannot encourage you enough. It is your job to position your child. Sometimes they're the prodigal. 
Sometimes you can do everything right and they still want to go drink from the vomit of the world. Our job as parents is to make sure that we have knowledge of the kingdom of God, that we're investing the kingdom of God, and that they have a revelation of who Jesus is. We're li living authentic lives in front of our children. We're not false. We're not one place in church and we're one place at home. We're real. But ultimately that we are positioning our children in a way that God can bless them. Because what, he, what she does is she positions Ruth in a position that now Ruth is not just uh, a gleaner. She's not a peasant. She's not a foreigner. She's not outside, if you will, uh, of, of, of the social status of Israel. She's not going to be a poor vagabond woman. It's Naomi who positions her in a place that she can be redeemed. It's Naomi that says, this is what you do and this is how you do it. Knowledge of the kingdom of God matters. Knowledge of what God does matters. And because of that and her willingness to submit, guess what? Boaz was overjoyed. He came and he redeemed her. He said, yes, I will take you. But I want you to point. <laughs> Look at the change in the expectation. They go into Israel as bitter, frustrated. I want to survive. To now maybe I have enough to make ends meet. To now she is going to become the wife of an extremely wealthy man. Why? Because of Naomi's understanding, Naomi's wisdom of the kingdom, Naomi's understanding of the kingdom, Naomi's guidance of the kingdom that positioned her in a place that took her from an outcast, took her from a peasant to a princess. And at the end, it goes on, she comes back and says, what happened? She, told her, she tells her what happened, and she says, listen... He will not stop until this is done because it gets complicated because there's a nearer kinsman. I don't want to go into all that. He has to go and negotiate the situation, right? But I wanted to point out that he... Notice, the, this is the time where faith comes. It's interesting because... Tell me where faith... Where, where is faith in this? Tell me where Naomi is walking around saying, you just got to speak Psalms and you got to speak the Word and you got to... You know. Listen, she's devastated. She's lost everything. She doesn't have, you know, I don't want to say that. But, okay, so, you know, sometimes we get those places in our life and preachers just want to go, you just got to speak the word, and you just got to walk the word, and you just like, don't you ever feel like I don't have any gas for that? Yeah. It's like, come on. Do you, do you understand? I've lost my husbands, I've lost my children, I've got no future, I've got no future for grandchildren, I've got no legacy. I've got this foreign woman that I'm dragging around that I don't know how I'm going to take care of, and you want me to be encouraged. I don't think so. But I want you to notice the difference. When the revelation of the Redeemer came, it changed the expectations. When the revelation of the Redeemer came, faith came. Now she's standing there with Ruth saying, he will not stop until this gets done. Where does that faith come from? It comes from a revelation of the Redeemer kinsman. It does not come from something inside. It comes from that revelation that, listen, this is what the covenant has provided for me. This is the faithfulness of the Redeemer. This is the goodness of the Redeemer. This is what he's committed to me. He will not stop. So I can now have faith in the revelation of who God is because I know who God is. That is, that is drastically different, folks. That is drastically different than saying, I have expectation and I want God to fit into my expectation versus seeing a revelation of God, experiencing a revelation of God that transforms my life and moves on and transforms my children's lives. And I'm going to end, I'm not going to read it, but if you go on and it says, you can read it at the end of chapter 4, that when... Ruth married Boaz. They had a child. The child's name was Obed. We all know this story. Do you, anybody know who Obed was? Tell me. Father of Jesse. Who's Jesse's father? David. Greatest king in Israel. You know what I love about the lineage of Jesus? There's a harlot in there. There's a thorner in there that doesn't even belong to the land. That's what a redeemer does. He takes what you are, redeems you not based on what you did, what you've earned, but based on who he is and what's available to him. And you won't know what's available to your redeemer until you have a revelation of him. 
And I can sit up here all day and tell you how to read and confess and have a positive mindset. But until you have a revelation of the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, the kindness, the generosity of God, you will not have faith for those things. I can walk around and confess it all day, but you will not have faith for those things. But it says at the end, and I'm going to leave this for you mothers. It said when the baby Obed was born, they did not give the baby to Ruth. It gave it to Naomi. It says at the end when they sang the song and they prophesied over Obed, they prophesied as if Naomi was the mother. Not Ruth. And I, I shared this last year, but in Father's Day, is that when we sow a seed into a kingdom that has no beginning and has no end, our seed is not bound by time and space. And my encourage to you this morning is that your knowledge of the kingdom matters. Even though your children may not feel like they're walking with the Lord, that does not mean they're beyond the reach of your Redeemer. Amen. Your lack of knowledge of the kingdom of God matters. Where we invest matters. When you sow a seed into a kingdom that has no beginning and has no end, it is not bound by time and space. So I want to encourage you mothers here today. We love you. Uh, I'm very thankful, uh, believe it or not, as a father of two kids, uh, invested a lot of money in college, and both of my girls are very, um, I would say, professional. What I always said is I want you to be a, uh, a productive member of society. Uh, they both are. Uh, my youngest daughter, just 21 years old, moved to Atlanta, 22 years old to Atlanta. <laughs> I'm thankful for things like, to a certain degree, I'm thankful for things like the Me Too movement because it protects young women in the workplace. Uh, I've seen firsthand men abuse young women in the first work, work, work place. I'm very thankful my kids have opportunities to have incomes and grow and be everything they want to be. I always encourage them to be a little independent. They have a little bit of independent in thinking, those kinds of things. I've always raised my girls that way. But there is no greater investment than a mother. There is no greater role than a mother. There is no greater impact you can have on the world than to be a mother. Period. End of conversation. And I honor you this morning and I bless you this morning. All right. I'm going to pick up just a little bit. I'm going to be really quick. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to talk more to mothers today. Nick gave you a great uh, um, overview of Ruth. I'm just going to highlight a few things about Ruth. We're going to talk about Hannah, and then we're going to we're going to end. Um, so the story of Ruth, uh, I love this. Was written by Samuel, and Samuel wrote Samuel. And so Samuel talks a lot about he talks about his mother, but he talks about Ruth and Naomi. Um, and I love that he tells that story. And for me, this story of Ruth is the story. It starts uh, with Naomi, and it's all from her perspective. Um, and so I, I'm going to point out more things for mothers really quickly, is that you can see that Naomi had influence over Ruth. Naomi had the instructions for Ruth. Naomi had something to pass on to Ruth. And um, that's, what, that's what we are here to do. We have, as mothers and well, as parents here, so for Mother's Day, we're going to dress moms. Um, but anyway, Naomi was just a mother-in-law. So as mother-in-laws, as stepmoms, as mothers, as grandmothers, any of those things, you have such influence over not only your children, but your family, your whole entire family. It can be, it can be nieces and nephews. It can be, uh, you know, all, all, anyone in your family. You have such great influence. And then you have um, the ability to instruct. And we can see that with Naomi. She instructed Ruth, as Nick pointed out. Um, Ruth didn't know what to do. And that's our jobs. That's what we're there to do. And, and the, the thing that we want to pass on is Jesus. What I want to pass on to my children, is, as Nick was saying, is, is I want to pass on his word. I want to pass on who God is. I want them to know so that, that they can pass on to their kids. See, I got a, I, I got a perspective of beyond. 
I've got a perspective of not just my kids, but now that my kids are grown, I'm going to have grandkids, and then they're going to have kids. I got, I got a legacy, as Nick would say. I've got something to leave. And the best thing about Ruth is, is, is that I think that the re reason Samuel wrote about him is because it was Naomi that instructed Ruth, but then through that lineage, through that from generation to generation, it ended up with David. But then where did it end up at? It ended up with the Redeemer kinsman. Amen. So here he introduced what a Redeemer kinsman could do, but in the end, it produced the Redeemer kinsman. So the instruction and the influence and all that she had brought about a legacy that brought forth Jesus. And that's what, that's, that's what as moms and as grandmothers and any of that, that's what we're there to do. I am there to leave a legacy that brings forth Jesus in my children so that they know who he is, so then they pass it on. And it goes from generation to generation. And so I'm just going to read a few scriptures um, just to highlight this. In Psalm 71, verse 18, it says, Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power in the next generation, your might to all who is to come. That's for me. I'm going to take that for my family. I've got some things that I need to declare. I, need, I want to be old and gray, Lord. I want to be older. So you want, I've got, I've got, there's things to come after me that I want to tell them about who you are. Um, and I want them to, to um, know. Not have just, I don't want them to just hear about. I want them to know. And then the next scripture, we're just going to uh, go over to Psalm 78. It says, Oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things from old, what we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and his wonders that he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach our children. So the next generations would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. You guys, you have such powerful influence and such powerful instructions to give your children. And I'm going to go really quick. I just want to look at Hannah real quick. We're going to go to 1 Samuel. And we all kind of know the story of Hannah, and I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. And I, want, and I can't talk about Mother's Days and the influence you have without talking about prayer. I love, love, love the power of prayer, okay? Because there's going to be times in your life when Nick says that you don't have the answers and you're having struggles and your kids are going through hard things and your children are acting in a way that you can't quite control yet. And there's doing things that... that um, all the influence and all my instructions sometimes just isn't going to work. So you know what? I got to turn to prayer. So I'm going to look at Hannah for a minute. So Hannah, we know the story. She wanted a child and she couldn't have one. So every time when they would go up to make their sacrifices, she would go to the temple and she would pray, Lord, give me a child. And one time she was praying so deeply that she, that Eli thought she was drunk because she's just crying and she's weeping and she's just uttering words. And he was like, get a hold of yourself, woman. That's basically what he said. Get it together. What is wrong with you? Right? But uh, that's a heart of a mother, isn't it? Don't, don't mess with me. Right? I, I, I'm pouring out my heart to the Lord. And so the Lord answered her and um, uh, she gave birth and she said, Lord, I will dedicate this child to you. I'll give this child to you. And so she weaned him and she took him back. And um, I'm going to read Psalms too. And this is what she said. First of all, I want to talk about prayer and praise. And we're going to read that here. Then Hannah prayed. And then she said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. I'm going to read it first. I'm going to read a different translation. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. And I'm going to read it in the, this is the New International Reader's Version. I love this. It says, then Hannah prayed. Then she said, the Lord has filled my heart with joy. He has made me strong. 
He has made me laugh at my enemies, and I am so glad that he has saved me. There isn't anyone holy like the Lord. There isn't anyone except him. There isn't any rock like our God. So I want to talk to you just to, just real quickly. I just want to encourage you. There's a writer that I like, and she says it like this. Prayer to God and praise of God releases the power of God. So I want to encourage you moms that, you know what, no matter the situation that's going on, the power of prayer and the power of praise releases the power of God. And sometimes, you know what that does? That goes in and it removes Satan's influence out of that situation. So sometimes when we don't know what to do, if we can pray and if we can praise and it releases the power of God, it removes the influence of, of, of the enemy in that situation. Um, and, you know, I, I'm going to read a scripture that doesn't really seem like it would be a scripture for mothers, but I want this to be a scripture for you today. And it's Psalms 144.1. And it says, praise be to the Lord, my rock. Does that sound familiar? Hannah said, you're my rock. You're my fortress. I know where I get my strength from, right? She said, and it says, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Listen, mom, you are warriors. You are warriors for your children. There is no fiercer power than the power of a mother. A couple weeks ago, did you read that story about a mom literally went after the mountain lion? She opened his mouth and took that child out of that mountain lion's mouth. Now, I know dads would do that too, but this morning we're talking to moms. But still, Nick is much more stronger than I am and probably a lot more braver. But that instinct kicked in. And listen, she became a warrior all of a sudden. She said, oh, no, there's nothing that is going to harm my child. And I just want to, um, I just really want to encourage you moms, you are warriors. Even if you don't sense it, even if you may not feel it, that the power of prayer and the power of praise releases the power of God into your children's home lives, in, into your children, into your family and into your home. And I even want to say if you're, if you're uh, married, even in, for, your, for your husband. Um, and so when we go back to Revelation, I wanted to say this. Our revelation empowers us first to be able to pass on instruction. It's like Nick said, I have a revelation that I want to pass on to my kids. I have a revelation, I have two girls, that I want to pass on to them. I want them to be warriors. I want them to be fierce for the Lord. I do not want them to be intimidated. I want them to know where their strength comes from. I want to know where their anchor comes from. I want them to know when life is hard, there is someone that we run to, that there, it doesn't matter where we go. They need to know that because life is going to be hard. There's going to be up and their downs, and I am making a, for, a fierce warrior for the Lord. Why? Because I expect that they're going to do that and they're going to pass it on. And then I get to be a grandma someday and grandma's going to pass it on and grandpa's going to pass it on and we're all going to pass it on because if you know my parents, they passed it on. So there's a legacy that we're going to keep passing on, moms. We're going to keep passing it on. And even if your children are grown, my children are 22 and 27, I don't have as much influence. I don't have quite as much instruction because now it's time to live their own lives. It is time for them to live their lives and know what God is. But I still have the ability to pray. And my prayer and my praise over my children will still release the power of God into their lives. And the one thing I want to encourage you in, if you're moms, is everything good that God has given to you. The number one place that should benefit from who you are is your family. Everything good that God has put inside of you, your family should benefit from it. Um, I, I, I did a little teaching a couple years ago, and it says, the life we live is the lesson you teach. The life you live is the lesson you teach. It's not what you say. It's how you live it. And the life I live is the lesson you teach. But I want to encourage you moms be prayer warriors, be prayer warriors, be prayer warriors. 
Take this word and pray this over your children, your grandchildren, your family, your home. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Prayer and praise releases the power of God. And everything good, I keep wanting to say this, if you are called to you, whatever, if you have whatever those gifts are inside of you, like Nick said, I, you know, I prophesy. So if I'm praying and the Lord gives me something for my kids, I go tell that to my kids. I say, you know what, honey? The Lord was thinking about you today. And do you know what the Lord told me about you today? And the Lord gave me a scripture today because I want to encourage my children. I want them to know that they are on God's mind and mama's praying for them. I want them to know if I can walk in uh, uh, revelation, I need to pass that on to my kids. I need to pass that on to my home. If I have have words of knowledge, all those kinds of things. I want to pass those on to my kids. Your family should benefit from who you are more than anybody else. And I think if Nick and I have been, um, our whole lives we've been around, we've been in church, and, and a lot of our friends absolutely do not serve God. They absolutely, almost all of our friends are divorced. We've been married 28 years. Very few of our friends are still put together, are still together. Their families um, are not together. And a lot of that comes from, we got, they got sent to church. They got sent to youth group. And they got sent to Christian school. But at home, mom and daddy weren't praying with them. They weren't prophesying over them. They weren't teaching them to praise. They weren't teaching them to pray. They weren't teaching them how to, to um, live in the world, but you're not of the world. They didn't benefit from all of mama's good things inside of her. A lot of times, and especially being a pastor's kids, is sometimes the pastors can be so worried and so busy with doing everything here that they forget about their family. And you can tell with my mom and dad, that is not the case. Like my mother would let us live with her, okay? All 13 of us would live together in one great big house and she would cook for us all the time. That would make my mother happy, okay? So um, I'm just saying is that pass all those things on. Who you are, let them benefit your family. Use everything that God has given to you. Pass that on to your kids. Pass that on to your home. Your home should be a safe place. Your should be a place should be a place of safety. They should know, you know what? I love this little saying, wherever mom is, that's where home is. They should be able to come to you. They should be able to run to you. They should be able to call you. I have one daughter that is a talker, and I have another daughter that's not so much of a talker, but when they need something, they both call their dad and I, and they'll even say, Mom, can you pray for me? You Absolutely, Mama can pray for you. Absolutely, Mama will pray for you. Absolutely, Dad will pray for you. Absolutely, we're going to see what the Word of God says about this. Absolutely. And um, uh, that's, that's what we want to do is pass on and pass on and pass on and pass on from generation to generation. And you have to, I want you to pass on your faith. I want you to pass on your strength. I want you to pass on that fierceness. I want you to pass on all the things that God has put in you. I want you to pass that on. Now, sometimes we have some things that aren't so great, but you know what? My kids know Sometimes mama gets a little upset. Mama might yell or mama might do all these kinds of things. But mama goes back and apologizes. I'm so sorry. That is not the way I should have acted. Will you forgive me? And my children always forgive me. Be real in front of your kids. Let them show them how a mom acts. Show them how a wife acts. Show them what it means to be a godly person because the world is going to try and tell them this is the way you should be and that is not true. We have to teach our children Christian foundations. You know what? Feminism and all this kind of stuff, this is what the world is going to tell you, but that is not true. That is not what the word of God says and that is not where blessing comes. It's a really hard thing to teach your children. The Bible does say submit to your husbands. My, I have a well, we won't talk about my children because I don't like it when my parents talk about me. But that's a hard word 
There's a lot of things that in this world, the world will tell, especially I have a, Jesus, I have a Generation Z and I have a Millennium. And there's a lot of these things that the world says, oh, you're a Millennial. This is how you're supposed to act. And you're a Gen Z and this is how you're going to act. But that's not true. The power of prayer, the power of praise releases the power of God. And it takes away that influence of the enemy of the world out of your child's life. And you can do that till you are old. Listen, I was going through a hard time, and uh, my mom called me one day to check on me, and let me tell you, my mama threw it down when she prayed for me, okay? My mom left no prisoners. There was no bars. She went to praying. She rebuked everything there was to rebuke. She took everything under authority. She began to release the power of God, and I'm just sitting there going, oh, yeah, okay, amen, amen, that's right, all right, there, there you go, and listen, my mom took her stance as a mom and still is, um, is still praying for me. I'm pretty old. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. <laughs> my mom and dad still pray for me. There's, and, and I'm going to just say in her life, there's, there's, there's three people. If nobody else ever prays for me, if my husband prays for me, and if my mom and my dad prays for me, that's all that I need, to be honest with you. If I know those three people, because those three people will tear down the gates of hell for me. And that's what a mom and a dad does. That's what a wife does. That's what a husband does. So can I encourage you? I know I, I, I always try and do a theme. If, you, if you'll remember, moms, pass on what you have. Let your family benefit from all of that. You are warriors for the Lord Jesus Christ. He has trained your hands for war. He has made you to go to the high places. You are a powerful force against the enemy in your family's life. Be everything that God wants you to be for your family. Be a strong mother. And the power of prayer. Never forget the power of prayer. Prayer to God and praise for God will release the power of God. Amen. So I hope you're encouraged this morning. And the only one thing I do want to say, I want to wrap this all up with is there's one thing in your home forever and ever that matters more than anything. And that is love. There's one scripture as mothers, as wives, just as women as general, but Specifically, we should all know 1 Corinthians 13. Because if you can wrap everything up in love, love is patient. Love is kind. All of those things that love is, you take that. I don't care what kind of background you come from. I don't care. You know, sometimes we can all say, well, you don't understand what kind of mother I had. And so I do this because of this. And I do this because of this. And you don't understand. My child does this. There is one scripture, that scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, is for every single mother to live up to, no matter what's happened in life. No matter where, if you came from a good family, not a good family, you had a mother, you didn't have a mother. As Christian women, as Christian women who stand on the foundations of the word of the Lord, that is from where we come from. Because if we can't do those things. It's going to be hard for us to pass those on. And I, one thing I just, I, I know this is my second closing, <laughs> is that in those moments, like Nick said, even as a mom, when you feel overwhelmed and you don't know what to do, you have to go back to the source of your revelation. You have to go back to the source of your peace. You have to go back as a mom and as a parent to the source that you get what it is that you need. So then you can go back and give it to your children. So just rem I, wanted, I wanted to re just remind you of that because there's so many times when it just seems like this child is not going to straighten up. I do not know what to do with this child. I have so many times had to go to the Lord over and over and over and say, Lord, I don't know what to do. I do not know what to do. I need your peace. I need your wisdom. I need your knowledge. I need your presence with me. I need to know how to speak to this child. I need to know how to love this child. I need to know what this child needs because I have one that talks and I have one that doesn't. And I have to know those things. And the Lord gives me 
those, that revelation that I need. And it's all wrapped up in love. Amen. Okay, that's my last closing. So happy Mother's Day. So why don't, why don't we have the moms stand up? All moms stand up. And I see a few people have their kids here. If you're a child and you're here with your mom, uh, Tanya's going to pray for the moms and bless them. If you're a husband in here with your wife, I want you to bless them. And I just think we should end by you praying a blessing over moms and just releasing that as they go. Is that okay? All right. Bless you. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Lord, you made us women just the way you wanted us to be. You made us to be mothers, Lord. You made us um, capable of giving life. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for all that you have made us. We thank you for all that you have given us. We thank you for the heart that you have given us, Lord, to, of love and nurturing and caring for another little human being, Lord. We thank you that we can give life. We thank you that we can pass on life. We can pass on our life in you. Lord, I just pray this morning that you would bless every single mom here, a grandmother, Lord. Um, if you're a mother-in-law, a stepmother, Lord, every single woman here I want to bless this morning. I just bless you in the name of the Lord. I just pray that you will find your strength in him. I just pray that you will find um, your peace in him. I just uh, speak over you that you just will have a, uh, uh, a revelation of how much God loves you so that you can pass that on to your children. I just pray a blessing, Lord. I pray a peace. Uh, I pray that, Lord, that you would just protect them. I pray that you would give them wisdom and just knowledge, Lord, of how to minister to their children and their grandchildren and all those that they have influence of. Lord, I thank you that you have empowered us with who you are, God, that we can tell our children and our children's and children about you, God, that we can leave a legacy of a part of ourselves, but also mostly, God, that we leave a legacy of, a, of our children that know you, who serve you, who worship you, Lord. Just bless every mother in here, Lord, today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Happy Mother's Day.